So we're live here at the town hall. We'll give folks a few minutes to come in. Wow, people were waiting at the door. That's great. Welcome, everyone. My name is Claire Baker. I'm Senior Director of Communications at Beyond Celiac, and welcome to the first town hall of 2023 for Beyond Celiac. Um, 2023 is exciting because it is actually the, the our 20th year of service to the, the celiac disease and gluten sensitive communities, and also uh, you know in, in our work to accelerate research for treatments and a cure. So happy to have you join us here for uh, for town hall of. of of 2023, first one. The agenda today for this town hall, we're going to um, give you an update on the progress of uh, research that Beyond Celiac has had a, um, a direct hand in um, driving, uh, both original research from us and also research that we've funded in the past and that uh, and some, some items that we have um, coming up. In fact, uh, it's, it's uh, we're not we're not quite ready to reveal, but we will be announcing uh, in the next few weeks um, some international uh, funder uh, grant making that we are doing, and the nature of those projects. It's really exciting stuff, and so um, so stay tuned for that. Um, we also have um, just an update on the top stories and research in 2022, and if we have time, we'll talk about the nationwide benchmark survey that we conducted with Harris Poll that was very revealing in terms of what the average person in the United States knows about celiac disease and managing it. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to um, uh, invite my colleagues to introduce themselves and then we'll just get on with the get on with the content. First, I'm going to turn it over to Amy Ratner. Uh, thanks, Claire. So I'm Amy Ratner. I'm the director of scientific affairs for Beyond Celiac. And just as a prelude to um, what you'll hear today, um, 2022 was an extremely busy year for our science department. Um, the research that Claire had mentioned, details of which we aren't yet ready to share, um, was um, a major, major project for us, and it spans really the globe. And um, so we're excited to talk about that more when we can. And now I'll um, turn things over to my colleague, Erin. Thanks, Amy. Hi, my name is Erin Miller. I'm the Associate Science Project Manager at Beyond Celiac. And um, as a preview to what I'll be talking about today. Um, I look forward to sharing with you some of the posters that Beyond Celiac has put together and had the opportunity to present this year. Very exciting. So we will get started with the um, the research that we funded that we, that we are at liberty to discuss. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Amy to talk about that. Thank you. So um, the first study that I'll tell you a little bit about is one that was done in conjunction with the Society for the Study of Celiac Disease, which is a group of scientists in the U.S. who um, have devoted their careers really to the study of celiac disease. And so um, we call it the Beyond Celiac SSCD um, Investigator Award, Early Career Investigator Award, I think is the actual name of it. And so that award was given to Dr. Arnold Hahn from Columbia University, and his work is going to explore the contribution of a T cell subtype called the CD8 T cell to the abnormal immune response to gluten. Um, and this work will help enable the development of new therapeutic st uh, strategies. So that means new ways to treat celiac disease. And you'll notice when I talk about the research that we're funding that the CD8 T cells um, keep coming up. So clearly there's something going on there in relationship to celiac disease and our better understanding of it. And what T cells are, they're critical components of the immune system. And when that immune system is functioning the way it should, they regulate the body's immune response to microorganisms that can cause disease. In celiac disease, things go a little bit haywire and the T cells 
inappropriately perceive gluten as a threat and trigger the immune response. And then as probably a lot of you know, that damages the intestine and the, and the other organs. Um, one of the interesting things about Dr. Hahn's research is that he's going to use organoids, um, which are a very cool scientific um, strategy that at Beyond Celiac, we love to talk about. Um, but what or organoids are, are they're tiny three-dimensional masses of tissue that are made by growing stem cells. So those are the cells from which other types of cells develop, and you do it in the laboratory. So it's like a little, um, the way it's kind of been described is like a little mini gut that um, I'll say it functions in a Petri dish that just for your understanding of it, but, but that's kind of the idea behind it. And then what, what, how, why, the, how they're being used in celiac disease is they're being used to recreate cel or what Dr. Han is doing is he's using these organoids to recreate celiac disease, to dissect the mechanisms of how it works. Um, he has a two year, um, $180,000 grant funded by Beyond Celiac and, um, the SSCD, uh, played the role of um, overseeing the selection process whereby Dr. Han was awarded the grant. Um, and also in 2022, we um, funded other grants that they were more the continuation of other grants, including one that is about to be completed by researchers at Oxford University. They also were looking into CD8 T cells and uh, their read on it was that they are abundant in the gut of celiac disease patients, even when they're on the gluten-free diet. Um, early findings of the Oxford study showed that in those who have celiac disease, the gut is permanently altered. Um, the researchers at Oxford are looking for answers to questions about what the CD8 T cells are doing in cel celiac disease, what kind of CD8 T cells um, are found and how they're using what they called highly targeted receptors in response to gluten. And they're looking at this in both adults and children. Um, the Oxford researchers spoke at um, one of our premier events in 2022, which was our research summit. And um, they, they're are recordings of their presentations on our website, and there are also written descriptions of that work, and um, those might be um, added to the chat so that if you feel like taking a look at either the video or reading the stories about them, you can read a little bit more about this exciting work that's going on. Um, as I had mentioned, the study is just about complete. We're looking forward to it um, resulting in some publications. And one of the reasons that we focus on publications is that published research is so important in furthering and advancing research. And so when we look to fund um, investigators, we're always hopeful that it'll eventually lead to published research. And it looks like this um, study is on track to do that. And I also just want to remind you that over the past couple of years, we've been funding um, also research being done at Sheffield University, where the scientists there are looking into the neurological and neuropsychological manifestations of celiac disease. Um, the, uh, the idea of our support of that research is that to, it's to investigate something that we suspect, but we're looking for the evidence of it, which is that um, celiac disease is not well, we pretty much know this, it's not just we suspect it, but that celiac disease is not just an, a gastrointestinal disease. And so we're looking for uh, what for this research to show evidence of neurological um, symptoms of celiac disease as well. So uh, let's see where, and I think that um, sums up what we um have been doing in terms of the research that we fund. And now Aaron can talk a little bit about uh, research that was done by Beyond Celiac as an organization itself. So we're uh, scientists in our own right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the uh, projects hmm. that we worked on um, in the past um, year is that we created a poster for presentation at Digestive Disease Week, which is um, a large national conference um, that focuses on all types of digestive diseases, but one um, 
type is celiac disease. And in collaboration with the National Minority Quality Forum, um, we've uh, created the celiac index. And from the celiac index, um, we've input data from both Medicare and Medicaid and created maps that show the distribution of celiac disease across the United States. Um, and so in our poster presentation, we were able to show where these beneficiaries of Medicare and Medicaid um, had claims for celiac disease. And what we found um, in 2016 is that most of these claims are actually in the Northeast in the United States, as well as the upper Midwest and the Western coast of the United States. But for some reason in the Southern part of the United States, these claims aren't um, as prevalent. Um, so there are much fewer claims than we would expect. Um, and we created this map and um, we compared um, 20, 2016 for these Medicare beneficiaries um, for celiac disease to 2016 Medicare beneficiaries for, for those who had claims for irritable bowel syndrome and anemia. And when we looked at those who had irritable bowel syndrome and anemia versus those who had celiac disease, we found something quite interesting, which is that the geographic distribution was actually essentially the opposite for those with IBS and anemia, meaning that those claims were showing up essentially just in the South. Um, and that's where there wasn't as many claims for celiac disease. And so what this led us to think is that there might be more misdiagnoses in the South um, because these people may be instead um, being diagnosed with IBS and anemia. Of course, this um, study is more observational in nature um, and it doesn't prove that there was misdiagnosis happening in these cases. So there definitely needs to be further research to show that misdiagnosis is happening, but this does help researchers further down the road um, give, um, essentially give them a key to look into what could be happening there. And they can look into, um, is it that I, they're being, people are being diagnosed with IBS instead, people are being diagnosed with just anemia or something else is happening altogether. Um, but it definitely gives a look into what's happening in the South um, and if people aren't being um, looked into as much as they should be. Also in the study, we did look at um, other types of diversity in addition to geographic diversity. For example, in between Medicare and Medicaid, we looked into um, gender disparity that could exist between um, Medicare and Medicaid. And we found that actually there were similar um, amounts of people, um, for example, women um, diagnosed with, for, with celiac disease between the Medicare population and the Medicaid population. And, but between the Medicaid population and the Medicare population, there were far more people um, that were Hispanic diagnosed for, with celiac disease in the Medicaid population compared to the Medicare population. So that was also interesting to note. I, and I'm just gonna jump in and note some, so research means so many different things. We have you know, very controlled research settings with the organoids, which is super cool because you know, it's like, a, imagine a little mini uh, uh, small intestine that you can test stuff on and you don't actually have to worry that you're causing harm to a human, you know, so you could, so that moves along at one place and that's called uh, basic research, right? Am, am I right? You get, so that's basic research, but it, it can move at a different kind of pace uh, with, look, here's a, here, here's what we want to test now. Let's see what happens to our organoid versus population, essentially population data with a whole bunch of variables that we can't control for because it's real people in real life, but we can, by by working both in, in, ends of you know that population data you know more social sciencey it's not really social science but it's more you know that big messy stuff and the really controlled stuff we're kind of working both both ends toward the middle to be able to accelerate research for treatments and a cure let's find those people who aren't diagnosed by using big data sets and working with the NMQF on that project and let's figure out what's going on in the gut by working with researchers at Columbia University who are building organoids which are teeny tiny little small intestines so 
Yeah, that's my, I, I'm a, I'm not a scientist, but I'm a geek apparently, because I find all of this super interesting. Um, so Aaron, back, back to you. I know you have another one to, you want to talk about the, the ICDS one? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're, you're absolutely right that there's so many uh, types of research and so many ways to get involved in research. You could get involved in research by doing a clinical trial, for example, or you could get involved in research by sharing your experience, which is exactly what I want to talk about with this uh, next um, analysis that we did. Um, so like you mentioned, Claire, we also presented a poster at the International Celiac Disease Conference, um, which was in Italy this year. Um, and with this, we looked at um, gastrointestinal symptoms versus non-GI symptoms, and non-GI symptoms can be things like joint pain or anxiety or um, skin rash or things like that. Um, and how we collected this data was actually through our Go Beyond Celiac Patient Experience Registry, which all of you have the opportunity to sign up for right now. Um, just a little plug right there. Um, and um, from this online, uh, from one of our surveys in this registry, um, we um, this survey collects information on different GI symptoms that you all might have and different non-GI symptoms, and we analyze those to really understand um, just what symptoms people have and when people who are diagnosed with celiac disease or other gluten-related disorders may only have um, GI symptoms or may only have non-GI symptoms. And what we found was also really interesting from that. Um, so of all the people that took the survey, 91%, um, um, so most people um, did report experiencing symptoms when um, exposed to gluten. Um, but what we found was that um, of those who experienced symptoms, 98% um, had GI symptoms, but also 96% had non-GI symptoms. And so those are all those um, things that really are anything that you don't consider like a tummy problem. Um, so most people do have these non-GI symptoms as well. Um, and thinking about just what are the most common um, GI and non-GI symptoms. So the top GI symptoms um, among the population um, are things like abdominal pain or discomfort, um, abdominal bloating, and the third one is just gassiness. Um, but the top non-GI symptoms are fatigue, brain fog, and irritability. And what's really interesting is that fatigue um, comes in at 83%. Um, and that's actually a higher percentage in this population than the second most common GI symptom, which is abdominal bloating. So non-GI symptoms are really, really common in this population. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to note is that we did look at people who only experienced GI symptoms and only experienced non-GI symptoms. And so people who experienced GI symptoms but don't have any of these non-GI symptoms, there were about 3% of people who said only GI symptoms, they don't ever have things like brain fog or anxiety or anything like that. But we actually found that 1.1% of people report only non-GI symptoms, and these are people with celiac disease or other gluten-related disorders. And so this is a really important piece of our community um, that or portion of our community that have only non-GI symptoms. And so this is really important for physicians, dietitians, and researchers to be aware of um, because they need to know this when considering things like diagnostic screening or celiac disease management um, and things like um, endpoints and clinical trials um, so that these people aren't missed when, um, when looking out for celiac disease and things like that. So for our audience, Aaron and I both have celiac disease, and I'm one of the many people with celiac who didn't didn't realize I had symptoms until I went gluten free, and then I was like, oh gosh, I feel so much better. And it didn't even it, it was wasn't until you know several years after that, and I started working for Beyond Celiac that I realized that the brain fog that I had been experiencing prior to diagnosis was related to celiac disease. I thought, oh, I just my my GI symptoms that I didn't realize everybody didn't just feel kind of yuck, yucky all the time that that all got better but then the brain fog went away oh yeah now i don't have canker sores you know it was just like kind of an eye opener aaron was your experience like that too 
Yeah, absolutely. One of my um, most common symptoms actually is migraine. Um, and I've been diagnosed with migraine actually years longer than I've been diagnosed with celiac disease. And that connection for me just wasn't made until after my celiac disease diagnosis. And if I'm ever glutened, migraine is absolutely the first symptom I have. Um, and so I think it's just really important to understand um, that GI symptoms and non-GI symptoms, I don't think they're, <laughs> we need to think about them separately. I think we need to think about all of this together when thinking about diagnosis, when thinking about management, because I don't think we're ever going to catch everyone in screening. I don't think we're going to catch um, or be able to truly understand um, the needs for follow-up until we really look at um, all of what we're seeing here. It's interesting because the definition of celiac disease requires damage to the villi in the small intestine, but it's not a, just a GI disease. So um, I got to wonder if that, if if at some point in the future there will be a a change in a change in how it is diagnosed. But for now, what we've got is you know, do you have the antibodies? Do you have uh, villus atrophy? You know, are your is your small intestine damaged? And you only know that through an endoscopy and biopsy for sure. So. Um, the more we know, the 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 more it calls into question. I think um, the you know uh, what we're doing now and where we might want to go in the future. The royal we, the the research and the medical community as well, and the value of patient you know com community participation in uh, you know both telling the story and then then helping beyond celiac be able to educate beyond our community um, about the challenges that we face. So um, I probably interrupted you. Did you have more more you wanted to add on that? Shall you want me to jump in with the, the other ICDS study? The only thing I'd like to add is if you'd like to be involved in this type of research, um, the survey that we pulled data from from this is actually still open. So of course, if you're not registered for Go Beyond Celiac already, I'd highly encourage it. Um, and we also have some other really interesting surveys on there as well. And then they, uh, we had a second poster accepted to the International Celiac Disease Symposium in 2022, and it's a it's one that I drove. Um, I've worked at Beyond Celiac. Uh, I'm coming up on nine years, and I and in 2014 we had done a community survey in which we asked uh, people's satis asked about people's satisfaction with the gluten free diet as the treatment for celiac disease, and then we asked again in 2022, and there was a marked change. Um, and and it's it's phrased a little inside out, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read it. Um, but the gist is, are we as a, a survey respondents are much less satisfied with the gluten free diet as the only treatment for celiac disease now. But it's uh, so survey participants who agreed a great deal that the gluten free diet is an adequate treatment um, for celiac disease has decreased by more than half. In 2014, of the 1,460 survey participants, about 27% agreed um, to, uh, to today's 12% agreed that the gluten-free diet is sufficient treatment. So I, it, it's, a, it's worded a little wonky, but we had to word it the same way in 2022 as we did in 2014 so that we could compare them other than just have a general sense of, yes, our community is less satisfied. Um, so that, that's why it's perhaps in 2014, if we had known that in eight, eight years hence, we would be doing a follow-up survey with this, made it not be quite so uh, so uh, backwards in terms of the, the phrasing, but, but it was still, it shows an enormous shift in our community's um, uh, receptivity to, frankly, treatments beyond the gluten-free diet less we are in general, I'm going to just go out there and say it. We, as, we um, are coming to, to know that the gluten-free diet is not always effective for, not effective for everyone, not a hundred percent effective. And we many of us are at risk. We, you know, we get gluten, even those of us who are super careful all the time, including myself, I get gluten. Usually it's my own fault. I don't mean to, but I, I you know, it, th these things happen. So Really, this is the best we have. Is sort of the 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 tone that I uh, I'm setting forth there. So um, that might might not need to say more about that. But it's 
it's great that we have the participants. And that one wasn't through Go Beyond Celiac. Go Beyond Celiac didn't exist in 2014. We built that a couple of years after that. So if you get a survey in your inbox from Beyond Celiac with a, uh, that's not through Go Beyond Celiac, it still might turn into something we're able to use for research. So thank you for, if you recall filling out that survey in 2022, thank you. Um, let us move to the next. The Harris Poll, we got time. So another project we did in uh, 22 was uh, the first national benchmark study for celiac disease. We worked with Harris Poll to, um, to survey using all of the Harris Poll, you know, functionality. We vetted questions that, that you know, we, we validated our questions and they distributed it to more than 2000 people who, uh, who replied and, and we compiled findings based you know, the 2022 findings that just the, the top ones, I won't go through all of them, but, uh, we learned that only half of Americans say they know anything about celiac disease or gluten sensitivity. So still 50% of the population out there will tell you they don't know anything about it. So if you are feeling like you go into a restaurant and you look in the eyes of the uh, waiter and you think maybe they don't know what you're talking about, it's a coin toss. <laughs> some some restaurants are very good, and we know this, and some are are not. And so it's always a, you know, yeah, do you know what I'm talking about? And and uh, and look for those clues when they are or are not. Second big finding: only one third realize that half of us are still un undiagnosed. So there's a, the a kind of a easier way to phrase that is: a third of the people out there don't realize that that many people with celiac disease are walking around undiagnosed, that it's still a big problem um, in terms of even people who, who have it don't know that they have it, but other people are unaware that it's, you, you might have it not know. And that comes into play in households. You know, it's like if people are, if you're, if you're married to somebody and you have ongoing symptoms and they don't get it, the, both of you might be at a loss in terms of, uh, knowing that there is a diagnosable uh, problem that, that needs to be addressed. Um, and then um, only about a quarter of Americans know that celiac disease is an autoimmune disease. And that kind of makes sense to me. I, I really wasn't very familiar with what an autoimmune disease was before I got diagnosed with celiac disease. It was like, we get diagnosed and we have to become experts in all of this stuff. And so it's not, it was, that one is not a huge surprise that, uh, uh, regular Americans, especially if half of them don't know what celiac disease is, that they would be unaware that it's an autoimmune disease. It's probably compounded by the shorthand that a lot of us use by calling it a gluten allergy. You know, people understand allergy a little bit better. So that's a shorthand that's out there, but it also might be contributing to the to the misunderstanding of celiac disease as an autoimmune disease. So anyway, we have this benchmark survey. We now know that you know where Americans uh, stood in their awareness and understanding of celiac disease. Um, and then we can go forward, M moving forward, we can measure um, hopefully changes for, uh, for the better, changes that, that people are becoming more educated and, and coming to a better understanding of the burden of this disease, who has it, and what this disease really looks like. So that's the, that was the benchmark survey. We're going to now move on to uh, research that we covered but didn't, uh, didn't participate in directly. Amy's going to give us a, a rundown of some of the top stories um, from 2022 in research. So um, as I'm listening to Claire and Aaron uh, describe some of the work that's been done here, which of course I'm familiar with, but it's nice to always be reminded of how many things we're doing, but, um, and there are so many different threads you could follow, but I noticed in the chat that someone had said, it seems like we're talking a lot about um, symptoms and can we talk a little bit about treatments and cures? And I think that um, the top five um, stories from 2022 really run the gamut. Um, 
And so we might even say that if this were Sesame Street, um, it would be sponsored by the letter S for symptoms. So um, because I know all about how you have to build uh, drama and intrigue, we are going to start start with the fifth most popular uh, story that we did in um, 2022. And guess what it's about? It's about symptoms. <laughs> and it uh, this was research that, again, this is not research that um, Beyond Celiac did. This is research done by all of these stories are um, about research that was done by other people. So um, what this study found was that five years after diagnosis, more than half of those with celiac disease still have symptoms. And the study was based on a review of medical charts. So it wasn't um, a survey or something like that. It was based on what was in the medical records. Um, in those who had symptoms, the symptoms that led to diagnosis lingered for the first year in more than 75% of people, which you might expect. You might say, well, it takes a while to heal. So even if you're not eating gluten, um, you may still be suffering from some of the symptoms that are as a result of the damage that's been done to your intestine. But for, in the second year, 60% still had symptoms. And uh, in the third through fifth year, so this covers the gamut to the end of those five years, 50% of people still reported that they had symptoms. Um, the most common gastrointestinal symptoms were diarrhea, abdominal pain, weight loss, bloating, and constipation. And interestingly, this study did address not just gastrointestinal symptoms, but non-gastro symptoms. And some of the things that Claire and Aaron talked about uh, raised their hands again. And so these common symptoms were anemia, fatigue, joint stiffness, headache, so Aaron can relate to this, uh, peripheral neuropathy, those were the most common that were found. Um, this is also an interesting um, bit of evidence that came out of this study was that when they did the TTG test, which we think of as um, the gold, well, not the gold standard, but the diagnostic test that's pretty reliable for celiac disease that precedes having a biopsy, um, when, and it's also used for follow-up only because we don't have anything else. It's not truly designed to be used in follow-up, but it is often used in follow-up. So for example, if you are diagnosed and you're on the diet for a while and you go back to your doctor, he, he or she may run a new TTG test to make sure you're not getting gluten in your diet. But what they found in this study was that the results of this TTG test um, and biopsies that were done as follow-up were not significantly associated with being symptomatic or not. And this is one of those so hard to understand aspects of celiac disease. You would think that if you were symptomatic, you would certainly have positive blood test results and you would certainly have you would certainly this would certainly show up on biopsy. But what this study found is that neither of these were significantly associated with being symptomatic. So it's that kind of hard to unravel aspect of celiac disease. What do symptoms tell you? What do what do blood tests tell you? What do the biopsies tell you? Um, and and also um, this isn't the first time that a study has shown that people with celiac disease on the gluten-free diet continue to have symptoms, elevated antibodies to gluten, which now can be uh, detected in either blood tests or urine or stool tests. And even on the gluten-free diet, there continues to be damage to the lining of the intestine. So this is why when we say that the gluten-free diet is not a complete treatment, it's based on this kind of evidence, which has been growing and growing, that um, for all the good that the gluten-free diet does and all the ways in which it can improve your life if you have celiac disease, it's not the be-all and end-all and that there should be other options. Um, there, are, In other diseases where diet is involved, patients are not expected to solely rely on that diet. So that's kind of the direction that we want to go in and where we see evidence pushing us toward in celiac disease is toward these new treatments um, and potentially, and eventually, not potentially, eventually a cure for celiac disease. Um, so the fourth most popular story has to do with drugs to treat celiac disease. 
And while I wish it was ultimately good news, <laughs> this story was not because this story was about the discontinuation of the only celiac disease drug that had reached the level of phase three clinical trials. So um, someone I think had earlier asked about what are the phases of of um, clinical trials. There's preclinical, which is uh, mainly done to make sure that the treatment doesn't do any harm. And it's either um, either done in small amounts of patients or not in patients at all. It's done in healthy controls. Then you move into phase one, which involves, a, a, it does involve study participants and establishes the um, what they call efficacy, the ability of establishing the ability of the drug to do what you say it can do in a small number of people. And then phase two expands to a larger number of people. And phase three is when you get to really, really large numbers of study participants. And that was one of the problems with that led that's one of the problems that cropped up with this drug, um, which was being um investigated by something called nine meters. This drug had been um, handled by a variety of different companies over the years, but that's who it ultimately ended up with nine, with, was with nine meters. It was called lorazotide acetate. And in the process of doing this trial, what the company found out was that the size of the treatment group that would be needed to determine a significant clinical outcome between study participants who got the drug and those who were getting a placebo was too large to support continuation of a trial. That's the reason that um, the company gave when they decided to um, discontinue the trial, which sort of brings us to a question we get asked a lot, which is, well, which drug is going to be the drug that is going to be the first one on the market? And um, that's a little bit like playing the lottery <laughs> or maybe participating in all this sports betting that I see advertised everywhere, <laughs> every game I watch on television. It, nobody really knows. And for a long time, uh, lorazotide acetate was really at the head of the race. And that's um, sh shown uh, how you can tell that that's true is that they're the only celiac that was the only celiac drug that reached phase three, and now it's been discontinued. Um, I don't. When it was discontinued, the the company said they were going to look into it further and see if there was some way that they could tease out um, some information that might lead to it being um, used in perhaps maybe different kind of patient group or, you know, something along those lines. But so far, we don't know of any uh, new developments with that drug and whether it will be revived or not. So all we can say right now is that the trial was discontinued. Um, so, and while that's not necessarily good news, I, I guess I also would want to reassure you that we have a drug pipeline that we can put in the um, the chat, a link to that, that shows a really healthy number of celiac disease drugs under study. And um, we hear frequently of others that may have the potential to end up on that drug pipeline. So it's not as though the end of this one drug is um, indicative of what's gonna happen to any other drug. It, it could be that a drug that's in an earlier phase right now might pull ahead. You know, we were, you, there's really no way that we can predict that. And I've heard celiac disease experts who are involved in research talk about the same topic and say they don't really know um, who they would put their money on if they were in a betting pool as to who was going to actually be the first drug approved. And so I, I just want to throw in that just because a, a drug doesn't advance in clinical trials right now with this company doesn't mean it's done. This lorazotide has been around for a long time. It's been around for was it the, like the first one and it's been around for 12 years or something and it keeps kind of, or is it, am I thinking of latagglutinase? Those two have been around. Both of the them are, the, those are the two that um, that are so easy to confuse <laughs> and have a similar uh, lifetime history, I guess I would say. Although uh, latagglutinase is still very, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, going forward, but it's still very actively being pursued. So and, yeah, and so even if even if a drug isn't isn't advanced at this time, it doesn't mean that it's over and done. It might come back around with a different 
uh, a different company, you know, like these, these drug assets get bought and sold and it's, they are, you know, uh, the drug companies are, they want winners, they want them to work, but they also have to do this cost benefit analysis between how, what it's going to take to, to get it to market, you know, to prove that it works and get it to market. So that's kind of, that was kind of reading between the lines on the, on the lorazotide acetate. So we'll see. I'll talk back to you, Amy. Sorry. I just, yeah. Thought I'd throw and it. you know, I, it would be great to, to hear something definitive about, um, the drug that had been being most recently developed by nine meters, but so far we, we haven't heard anything and we, you know, keep our ear to the ground. And, uh, if anything happens, um, you know, we'll report on it, but for now it's, it's kind of, um, the only thing, like I said, we can say is that it's discontinued. Um, but the, the, the number three top story does have some, um, so if we go from maybe not the news we wanted to hear in the fourth most popular story, we go to news that is good in a certain, you know, well, it's good no matter what for the number three story. And that was that the, that the increased risk of cancer in celiac disease is small and it's limited to diagnosis after 40. And this was a study done in Sweden, but it also involved researchers um, from Columbia University. And the study concluded that overall, um, the reason they say that the risk is small is that overall, the increased risk in cancer results in one extra ca case of cancer in 125 celiac disease patients followed for 10 years. So think about those numbers for a little while. And it shows that while there is an increased risk, it's not um, something that you should be uh, overly anxious about. Um, the overall risk was highest in those diagnosed uh, after the age of 60, and it was not increased in those diagnosed before the age of 40. And uh, despite the increases, so one of the things that the researchers wanted to see is how is the changing world of celiac disease um, affecting what we know um, about uh, about risk and the actual risk itself. And what they found was that despite the increase in diagnosis rates, awareness of celiac disease and gluten-free of food availability, this small but detectable increase in cancer has remained pretty much the same. So it's always been relatively small and um, more likely to occur in a, a person who's diagnosed when they're older. So um, but one of the other things they did conclude from this is that because the increased risk is confined to older individuals and it tends to decrease over time after diagnosis, that that's a beneficial effect of the gluten-free diet. So that's good news. You know, on those days when you're thinking, I'm trying so hard and this gluten-free diet is still uh, difficult. And as Claire said, I get glutened accidentally every once in a while. Overall, there is the implication of a beneficial effect of the gluten-free diet because those who've been who've been on it for a long time, based on age, tend to have a lower risk of cancer. So I would put that in the good news category um, for today. Um, the remaining top two most popular stories do have to do with drugs and celiac disease. And both of these stories were reported out of Digestive Disease Week, where um, experts who are uh, working along with pharmaceutical companies to develop these drugs updated the scientific community on what's happening. So the second most popular story was about a potential celiac disease drug that breaks down um, glute, that breaks down gluten, protects against damage to the small intestine. And this is about a drug we talked about a few minutes ago called lactoglutinase. Um, it's a treatment for celiac disease being developed by immunogenics. And they also found that it reduced and prevented uh, our, our um, letter of the day, S for symptoms. If this was a phase two study, so if you want to think about clinical trials, um, in this phase two study, 25% Participants with celiac disease on a gluten-free diet received about 1,200 milligrams of this drug daily, and a second group got a placebo. So a placebo is just something that mimics a drug 
doesn't actually contain any active ingredient. And the idea behind using a placebo is that the people in your study group um, don't know whether they're getting the drug or not. And that's important because other studies have found that sometimes when people think they're getting a drug, they have something called the placebo effect where they say they're feeling better and they actually probably do feel better, but it's more of a reaction to the idea of getting a drug than the actual active ingredient in the drug. So anyway, uh, both groups, so both the, the group receiving the drug and the, the group not receiving the drug um, were challenged with two grams of gluten a day for six weeks. Um, they gave them breadcrumbs that people ate with their evening meal. Um, people are usually interested in, oh, what kind of gluten am I going to get? Like, do I get a piece of chocolate cake or what? But um, that's way too much gluten. So I think the the companies studying these drugs are trying to improve what they give uh, study participants because people don't like what they refer to as the slurry, which is like a mix of wheat flour and water. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Something gross. Okay, so um, the... Lactoglucinase itself is a combination of two enzymes that work complementarily to break down and degrade gluten proteins in the stomach and make them inactive and less likely to cause symptoms and damage to the small intestine. Um, it's intended to be used in addition to the gluten-free diet to protect against damage from inadvertent gluten exposure. And I think that that's what in the early days of um, drugs that come to the market, that's what you'll find when we get to that point is that Early on, these drugs will be designed to work in addition to the gluten-free diet because that's the way that it's been determined. They're most likely to get approval. And then from there, researchers will continue to work on them with the goal of one day perhaps having them replace the gluten-free diet. So that was top story number two. Again, it's a, a drug that breaks down gluten and it showed that it did protect against damage. The top, the very most popular story of 2022 was about another drug um, that um, the way it works is it targets pathways in the liver to end the harmful response to gluten. So uh, the drug targets the liver's ability to clear harmful substances from the blood. And this drug showed promising results in the early phase of clinical trials. The drug is called CAN-101. And it's focused on restoring normal immune tolerance of gluten by targeting specific receptors on the liver. And then that sets off um, like what you might think of as a cascade of events that reteach the immune system not to respond to gluten. Now, whenever you talk about something that tinkers around in there with your immune system, people don't like that because, you know, they think about it as being overall your immune system um, being messed with by a drug, but this is not a broad immunosuppressant. It targets only the part of the immune system that drives celiac disease. Um, the company that's developing it is Enochian, and um, it, let's see, it leverages the natural process routinely pre performed in the liver. And one of the liver's functions is to clear out dying cells without causing inflammation. Um, results of a phase one study. So again, early, early stage of clinical, uh, early stage of trials um, showed that this drug induced T cell tolerance of gliadin, which is the harmful component of gluten um, in cases where study participants were getting a challenge. The study also looked at something that we hear more and more about in celiac disease, and that's IL-2 response. And once again, the CD8 T cells that we talked about in some of the research that we're sponsoring came up. Um, IL-2 is a cytokine um, signaling molecule in the immune system. And previous research has shown that there's a correlation between IL-2 and symptoms in celiac disease patients, including nausea and vomiting. So um, that was the facet of the study that looked at IL-2. And the other, the study also looked at the CD8 uh, T cells, which again are the cells that do damage to the lining of the intestine. And study participants who were given the placebo, and they were also getting a gluten challenge, had an increase in these cells following the challenge. And this effect is blunted or blocked in cases where the drug was given. 
So it's designed to be an intravenous infusion. It would be um, administered over several days for a period of weeks, and it's intended to protect against gluten exposure for a period of time that remains to be determined. And it, again, would also be used in addition to the gluten-free diet. So those are our, uh, our list of our top five hits for celiac disease news. Um, hopefully this year, 2023, we'll be bringing you even more updates on what's going on in the research world. And um, for two reasons, A, um, we can devote some attention to it and also because more and more is going on in that research world. I wanted to, I, I saw some I saw some words in the chat that, um, it kind of brought up a good point. A question came in: Can you can you take all three at once? And the answer is, these are not even available to take at all yet. There's still, you know, the phase three is the furthest along, and that study halted. Can 101, which sounds really interesting, is only in phase one, so that's that's years away. Yeah, you know, unless it gets accelerated. You know, the um, uh, lorazotide got kind of jumped to the front of the line and moved to phase three um, uh, with some speed. And so maybe that will happen with CANO 101. But if it follows the normal path, that'll be several years uh, down, the, down the road. So the question about whether or not more than one drug will come to market, the answer is someday, probably. You know, if you think about all of the ads we see on, on TV for, if you have depression, this thing can help. A bill, take a Bilify with your, you know, there could be uh, research well into the future about uh, what, what celiac drugs might be able to work uh, harmoniously within the system and not, not uh, kind of be a mess in there. So, uh, but the answer is not, none of it yet. And hopefully, um, some something we we want we want there to be the first winner and then the second winner and then the third winner. We would like to have our community have options because not everything is going to work the same for for everybody, and it's it's just part of the whole process. I also wanted to note the um, kind of the 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 added benefit of all of the research for treatment options that are coming along. It's also helping research identify quicker ways to tell if somebody's having a reaction to gluten because they can't really, you know, oh, we lost Amy. Um, we can't, uh, they can't really, um, you know, wait to see how much intestinal damage there is if they need to have a, have a, a maybe a cytokine reaction or something that indicates that, that there's a, a reaction to the gluten that's happening um, in, in a person's system. So the, just an extra um, uh, bonus, yay, bonus for uh, our community in terms of, uh, especially for people who went gluten-free uh, on the advice of a doctor or they saw, saw something out there that said, you feel yucky, try going gluten-free. Oh, I feel better. Now I'm not gonna go back on gluten to find out if I actually have celiac disease. It could be that there's gonna be a much shorter gluten challenge in our future uh, for those people who just don't have a real diagnosis because they're, they, they can't do a, a six week long gluten challenge because the symptoms are just too awful. Um, Amy's back. Um, Amy, I was talking about the side benefits of, uh, of, uh, that, that are coming along with, uh, for testing for a reaction to gluten exposure because, because researchers need, need a little faster, uh, inputs on whether or not their drugs are working. So, um, I was editorializing. Um, are you talking about the, you mean the, um, urine and stool tests? Is that what you mean? No, the IL, the ILS. Oh, I IL, IL2. IL2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because one of the things that about IL2 is that um, people who have celiac disease um, report that they have symptoms um, within two to three hours of accidental gluten in ingestion, which is so interesting to me because I've been involved with celiac disease for decades, <laughs> only because my daughter was diagnosed um, when she was two and she's 32. So that's a lot of decades. But it used the thinking used to be, oh no, people don't have that quick of a reaction. And it did take evidence and it did take um, input from the gluten-free community to say, yes, that is true. That does happen to me. But anyway, so um, people report that they're, they get symptoms relatively quickly after gluten ingestion. And what they're trying to look at 
in that uh, trial that I was talking about is that there's a suggestion that the magnitude of the IL-2 response may correlate with the symptoms. So in other words, if you get symptoms and the IL-2 goes up, that's a measurable, it's something that can be measured. And so that's why it has significance in this trial and, and overall in celiac disease. So if I'm a person and I have symptoms and my IL-2 and my IL goes up, that could help, say, Erin, uh, who doesn't get symptoms, but her IL-2 goes up. You're like, oh, she's having a reaction, but she didn't necessarily have the... Is that what you mean, Amy? Did I get that right? Well, I don't know. They're still sort of, according to this study, they're investigating whether the magnitude of the response, whether it does accurately correlate with symptoms. Okay. So, um, and I don't know whether they're distinguishing between GI symptoms and I would tend to think they were, but I'm not 100% sure. We have um, uh, a couple of minutes left and there are a couple of questions we want to get to. One was... Um, uh, can we talk about the risks of uh, participation in clinical trials? And we've we've talked to researchers quite a bit about this. Um, uh, Amy, do you think you're the best to to field that one? Well, I I, I can tell you what um, what I've heard when um, when this question is asked in a forum uh, where celiac uh, experts are gathered, and that is that when you're given a gluten challenge. It's in a controlled environment and the amount of gluten is never going to be excessive. Um, now they do, it, it has to be enough that it will generate some change because that's what the study is designed to do is to see, um, I have a group of people in the study that are gonna get the drug. I have a group of people in the study who are not gonna get the drug. We're gonna give them both gluten. And if there is there some sign that the drug is doing something to prevent the symptoms in the group that's getting the drugs compared to the group of people that are getting the challenge, but not the drug. They don't know they're not getting the drug, but they're not. And so there has to be some level of reaction, let's say, but they do try to control that Le you know, the least possible risk they can put you at. Also, clinical trials are not designed to go on and on and on forever. A lot of gluten challenges are measured in weeks versus, you know, months, um, certainly never years. So there are attempts to minimize the risk. That's not to say that sometimes someone doesn't get into a clinical trial, get the gluten challenge, and have a severe enough reaction that they withdraw from the trial. That does happen. And that's always your option. Um, but it's it's not like it's a free for all. Like they're gonna make you, you know, like a like participating in a clinical trial is gonna make you um, horribly sick for an extended period of time um, while scientists, you know, study you like some kind of a, you know, object. That's not really how it's designed. Um, and uh, and uh, just to note, there's so there's a uh, reaction to gluten, which is one thing. One would be a reaction to the drug itself. Um, so and those are those are different. But in the phase one, uh, phase one of clinical trials is designed to make sure that the, the drug won't actually harm you. I'm Aaron. I'm going to toss it to you. Yeah. And um, a lot of the risks are dependent on how the trial itself is set up. So, of course, there may be some minimal risks depending on if there's a blood draw um, associated with the trial. Um, if there's a biopsy, there's um, the associated risks of um, going through that procedure. Um, but all of these risks um, should be included in the protocol in the consent form. Um, so reading that protocol um, and discussing um, with um, the research coordinator um, any concerns you have um, can really just really help you understand um, just um, anything um, regarding those risks. Um, a lot of these risks might just vary from um, clinical trial to clinical trial, really just depending on um, what aspects um, or what procedures they might have you go through. Some trials um, currently don't have a gluten challenge at all. Um, and so um, just understanding what um, 
goes into that clinical trial um, will really help you grasp um, what risk might be associated. And yes, as Amy mentioned, um, you can drop out at any time of a clinical trial. And sometimes too, there are benefits to um, being involved in a clinical trial. Um, you can, you know, you can find out um, results of TTGs. You can know more about how your particular celiac disease is um, going in a way, aside from your own, your own understanding, but based on your knowing your body. But um, a lot of times there are um, because of the way they're monitoring study participants, you can find out things um, about your particular situation with um, celiac disease as well. And we at Beyond Celiac do um, do help in the recruitment uh, for for some of the, the clinical trials that are underway. We know that there are challenges both geographically, you might want to participate, but they're just not near you, or they might require you to have symptoms that you just don't have or, you know, that it's uh, the finding the, the match for the way the study is designed can be a challenge, but we just encourage you to, even if you've, you've tried before and you didn't make it into a clinical trial, doesn't mean you wouldn't qualify for a future one. So, so keep trying. I, I think it's because, because we, we in the community are willing to raise our hand and, and try for it. If you're, if you're, if, if it's something that can fit for you and your values in your life, it, it is advancing the advancing us toward uh, treatments and a cure. And without us, it won't happen. They just, it just can't happen. So um, I, we're almost, we're, we are out of time, but I'm going to uh, mention dermatitis herpetiformis because I saw DH come up in the, in the comments. DH um, affects 10% of people with celiac disease. It's the skin manifestation. It's a itchy, itchy skin rash. If you are a DH person, I send love and support to you. And the clinical trials that are underway right now do not address DH that I know of. So that is um, definitely an area in research that that uh, researchers need to pay attention to. So um, any- Probably the other, the other thing too um, that we should point out is that there are no clinical trials in pediatrics. So no clinical trials in children in celiac disease. And- Part of that is because it's most likely, particularly when you talk about a drug trial, of course, um, and that's the kind of trial I'm talking about. I'm talking about a clinical trial for a treatment. There are none that involve, um, that's not to say that there are no studies that involve children, but clinical trials for drug treatments do not, none of them are in the pediatric population. And there's some um, discussion around that and how that might happen safely. Um, but part of the reasoning behind it is that any drug in celiac disease is most likely to be approved in adults first. And then from there, there would be some movement toward pediatrics. But that, but um, so just to point that out in case you weren't thinking of it. And then to, to close us out, there was a question about, can we really expect a, a cure or treatments or a cure within 10 years? Beyond Celiac has, has set our sites for having treatments uh, toward a cure by 2030. We set that we set that goal three years ago. That was 10 years ago. We've got seven years, and uh, it's not a, it's not just words. There, are all the the key opinion leaders are also uh, reading the tea leaves, per, uh, seeing seeing the advances that we're making in in research, and also believe that that is true. So we're we're getting closer. We are getting closer, and uh, those of us on screen all have a uh, have personal stake in the matter, as well as the entire organization of Beyond Celiac. We're, this is this is our goal. This is what we're working on. So, um, with that, we're going to uh, wrap it up. If you um, are not yet part of the Go Beyond Celiac community, please uh, sign up for Go Beyond Celiac. The, the I think it's go.beyondceliac.org and um, uh, add your story to, to, the, to the data and sign up for our research news, uh, research newsletter so that you can get in your inbox the latest in celiac disease um, research. Uh, and we'll look for you at the next town hall in March. Thanks everybody. So long, everyone. Have a good day.